Parshas Boy, uh, and this week's share is sponsored by Ed and Cecile Gromis in memory of Ed's mother, Chana Gromis, Chana Bas Moshe Yehuda Koin, Aleha Shalom. The yard site is on seventh Shabbat. Um, sh- the Neshama should have an Aliyah. We should all be zeicher to see Tchias Hamesim. We're going to begin. I'm going to do something a little bit different this year, which I've not done before in the past, because uh, I, you know, generally we, we speak about general topics, broad topics. I want to focus on a very specific topic, and that's one of the ten plagues. You know that there's three plagues in Parshas Boi, and I'm going to focus on one of them, which is the plague of darkness. And we tend to think of the plague of darkness as the ninth plague. Actually, it's the last plague, because... Um, The plague of the death of the firstborn is really the beginning of the exodus uh, of the redemption process. So there's three groups of three and then one. We've discussed that in previous years. And the ninth plague, which is the choshech, darkness, is the last plague before redemption. So if you want to understand it, and I'm not going to go into the details of it, there's many Mephorshim who discuss this aspect of it, the 3-3-3 three, three and three and the 10th plague. We've spoken a lot about the 10th plague in past years. I want to focus just on the 9th plague because I think it's an extremely important um, plague, one that uh, um, conveys a lot of uh, uh, information about what was going on. And what's interesting about it is it's so controversial. The tenth plague is very controversial. Blood is easy, right? What was the what was the plague of blood? Plague of blood is all your water that you're going to drink is blood. It's not very tasty. We don't want to drink blood. We want to drink water. We don't want contaminated water. We don't want to get uh, the coronavirus or whatever it is, right? <laughs> what's the, what's the second plague? Frogs. Nobody wants frogs in their homes. Frogs everywhere. I get out of bed. There's frogs. I'm going in my kitchen. I want to make a cup of coffee. There's frogs. Everybody understands frogs. The next pl- plague is kinim, lice. Who wants lice? I don't want to be infected with lice. It's terrible. I have lice. I've got to put the terrible shampoo in my hair. But nobody wants lice, right? Everybody understands these plagues. What's the plague of darkness? What is the plague of darkness? So I'm going to read you the... So it's not so simple. So you say it's, everything is dark. You know what? It's dark every night. When you light a candle, you put the light on. Right? Or you just cope. It's a bit dark and I cope. Big deal. So it was dark for three days. Um, you know, have you ever lived in the North Pole? Yes. Or in Finland or in Iceland? It gets dark in the winter. It's dark the whole time. Big deal. So it was dark. What's the plague? What is the plague here? And by the way, it's an important plague. It's not the first plague. It's the last plague. So now, how are we meant to understand the plague of darkness? Now, the psukim convey more information than just this very childish notion of darkness. Mm -hmm. By the way, so much of our understanding of what happened in the Torah is based on our education as children, Mm -hmm. or in the case of the Ten Plagues, Sedanite, right? We, We chant, we sing the song about the Ten Plagues, darkness, darkness. What are we talking about? These are very, very important events at the dawn of Jewish history. These plagues didn't happen for nothing. They're conveying something, each one of them. And I know that I haven't gone into each one in detail over the years, but each one of these plagues conveys an important message because otherwise it wouldn't be in the Torah. The Torah, as I've said uh, hundreds of times before, is not a history book. It's not there just to tell you the story of the world. It's there to convey information that's useful to us living in whatever year we're living, in whichever place we're living, that somehow we can translate the messages of what's contained in the Torah and the narratives of the Torah, somehow it should be meaningful in our lives. What does the plague of darkness have as a message for us to the meaning of our lives? That's the focus of today's shir. We'll begin with the Psukim and Shmais Perik Yud, Pasuk Chof Aleph to Chof Gimel. 10, 21 to 23. God said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the heaven, towards the sky, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt. You could stop there, right? Everyone agree? There should be darkness over the land of Egypt, period. But the pasuk continues, the yomesh choshech, darkness which may be felt. What does that mean? 
The Yomei Shchoyshech. I can touch it. I can feel it. What does that mean? What does it mean? Okay, I, I know that you're going to come up with explanations, and the Mephoshim come up with explanations, but we need to understand what the Yomei Shchoyshech means, because it's superfluous to requirements. We don't need the Yomei Shchoyshech to understand that Moses was meant to bring darkness. By the way, it's a very strange thing. What do you mean? Stretch your hand out to the sky so that there be... What do you mean that there should be darkness? Well, he, he had to bring darkness? It's very easy. Wait until tonight. The sun is going to set and then there's going to be darkness in Egypt. What do you mean stretch your hand out to the heaven? What's miraculous about darkness? I'll tell you what, I'm going to become a miracle worker. Tonight, just come here at about 5.20. <laughs> I'm going to wave my stick at the sky. I'm going to say, you see... Now it was light, the sun was shining, and now it's going to go dark. And somebody, there's going to, oh, there's always a ibachochem. You know that word in Yiddish, ibachochem? There's going to be an ibachochem in the audience going to say, uh, excuse me, Rabbi Dana, uh, it, it was going to be dark anyway because it's shkia. And the sun was going to set anyway. No, I'm a miracle worker. I'm making it dark here in Beverly Hills. No, you're not. It was going to get dark anyway. And by the way, tomorrow is going to be 521 is going to be shkia. So tomorrow morning when you have this meeting, tomorrow afternoon, wave your arm at the air um, at 5.21. What is the miracle about bringing Choyshech on Mitzrayim? There's no miracle involved. The Yomesh Choyshech is also a problem. Next pasuk. Vayet Moshe yod ala shomayim, vayehi Choyshech afeilo b'chol eretz Mitzrayim. Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven and there was a Choyshech afeilo. We translate that as a thick darkness. Can I ask you a question? What's the difference between a thin darkness and a thick darkness? Don't come to me with any stories about Slimfast. <laughs> Honestly, what's the difference between a thick and a thin darkness? A thick dark... This darkness is a thick darkness. What are you talking about? Darkness is dark. Can I see? No, I can't see. It's dark. It's a thick type of darkness. I can't see in a particular kind of way. What are you talking about? Choyshech is choyshech. It could quite easily have said... What do you mean, Choshech Hafeila? Shloshet Yomim, for three days. Loirau Ish Es Ochiv, a person couldn't see his brother, his fellow man. Veloikomu Ish Mitacht of Shloshet Yomim, and no one could rise from its place for three days. Ulachobene Israel Hoya Urbe Moshvoisam, and for all the children of Israel, for the Israelites, they had light in their dwellings. Three pieces of information. Loirau Ish Es Ochiv. Loikamu ishmi tachtov, shloishes yomim, and chol b'nei Yisrael hoyo er b'moishvaisam. Three pieces of information there. Can I want to ask you a question? When it's dark, complete darkness, no light whatsoever. Can you see anybody? No, okay, no, you can't. If it's completely dark, I'm not talking about the light contaminated darkness that we all have here in cities. You know, I remember there was years ago. Ailey was in Yavne. There was there was a teacher there. He took us to Mount Pinos, and we saw that they're there they have there with telescopes. You can see the stars in the sky. It was quite remarkable. It's a place where you're told before you go, you've got to turn your headlights off before you get to the place where you look. There's complete, what we call in English, pitch black. Right? It's the darkest form of black that there could be. Darkness, complete darkness. Now, in complete darkness... Can you see anything? No, absolutely not. That's the whole concept of darkness. It's the total absence of light. In order to see anything, you need light. In which case, what is the Torah telling us when it says that there was darkness in the entire land of Egypt, that people couldn't see each other? Well, one assumes that they couldn't see each other. That was the whole purpose of this, I guess, plague, if you want to call it that. That's question number one. The question number two on this posik is, they didn't move from their place for three days. What's darkness got to do with moving? How exactly are we going to explain that? I mean, even somebody who's completely blind, do they stop moving? And of course not. They take a stick and they tap the stick against, you know, the areas in which they're walking so they know where they are. They walk from one place to another. Why weren't they, why weren't they moving? That's a... And the third question is quite an important question. It's to do with the third piece of information in the Pasuk. What does it say? That the Jewish people had light. One second. 
Was it dark in Egypt or wasn't it dark in Egypt? How are you going to explain the presence of light if there was complete darkness? Right? They had 3D vision glasses, goggles. What is going on here? How did the Jewish people have light? So the Midrashim are busy telling us that this gave the opportunity for the Jews to go into the home of the Egyptians and they could discover all their silver and their gold. And later on, when they left Egypt, they could go to those Egyptians and knock on their door and say, I'd like to borrow some silver and gold from you. And they but what? We don't have any. What are you talking about? Upstairs in the closet on the left, next to the landing, you have silver and gold. Oh, well, I guess they know and they had to lend it to them. It's a very nice medrash. I want to understand, practically speaking, how was there light for the Jews if there was darkness for Egyptians? We need to understand that. So these are all the questions which arise out of the Psukim in Perik Yud of Shmois. Let's look at Rashi. So we're going to begin, I have to tell you that this is going to be a bit of a journey. Today's shir is a journey. Uh, and we're going to start with classical and we're going to move to, you know, somewhat more um, original ideas and we're going to end up with something quite radical. So it's a, it's a bit of a journey. We'll begin with the classical perushim, the commentaries which explain darkness in the way that we heard it at school, if we went to Jewish day school or to Hebrew school, and then we're going to take it from there. This is a platform where we're going to broaden our minds and we're going to broaden our vision. Vision, get it? Because it's the plague of darkness. We're going to broaden our vision with regard to this plague, Maka of Choshech. Says Rashi, this is source number two, it's on page one of your source sheet, and you can download the source sheet online if you're listening online, and I, I would encourage you to do so. This is fascinating information. Remember, my first question was, it says, which we translated that, the darkness could be felt. Wasn't enough, it's v'yomesh choyshech. You could feel the darkness. What does it mean? It says Rashi, v'yachshich aleim choyshech yoyse mechesh koysha layla. He says there's only one explanation that can help us understand what it means v'yomesh choyshech. It means that the darkness would be darker darkness than the darkness of night. So here we are. Remember I said Pinny's going to be here to, tonight at 5.20. I'm going to wave my arm at the heavens. And it's going to get dark. And no, that's not a miracle. Everybody knows that when it comes to Shkia, the sun sets, darkness um, emerges, as it were, out of, the, um, uh, out of the dusk. And eventually it's nightfall and it's night and it's complete darkness. That's not a miracle, says Rashi. The words, V'yomesh Choshech, are there to tell you that the darkness that occurred during the Makkah of Choshech was darker than the darkness of night. In other words, Choshech Shalaila Yamish V'yachshich Oid. So the word V'yomesh is there to tell you that the darkness of night would be perceptibly darker than usual. Why is something a Makkah? What's the difference between having a cold and having the flu? I mean, I'm just using an example again. This is not coronavirus related. What's the difference between having a cold and having the flu? It's a big difference, right? Or really, what's the big difference? Both of them, you're blowing your nose and you're feeling a bit unwell and you wouldn't mind going to bed. But one of them is actually a real sickness. It's an infection. And the other one is just like a cold a virus, whatever it is. Okay? What's the difference between Lila? And Choshech, says Rashi. Lilo is the night. It's kind of, you, you just get through it. It's dark. It's not comfortable. Nobody wants to be in darkness. We prefer the sun to be shining. We prefer light. We can operate better in light. But we know that there's something called darkness when there's the absence of the sun and we don't have the source of light that we have during the day. And that's, it's dark. And then there's something which is even worse, which is called Choshech, says Rashi, which is worse or stronger than the darkness that we're used to with the darkness of night. That was the Makkah of Choshech. How do we explain it? I can't really explain it. Rashi's not really explaining it. He's just saying, I'm trying to explain to you what the V'yomesh Choshech means. The V'yomesh Choshech is there to tell you that the Choshech was not the ordinary Choshech darkness of night. There was, it was 
it exceeded the darkness of night and that turned it from something which was bearable and something that you can get along with to something which was unbearable and made it terrible. Okay, that's what Rashi says. Says the Ramban, I've not included the Hebrew here, I've just put the translation, the plague of darkness was not just that there was a lack of sunlight, it exceeded nighttime darkness. It was Choshech Afela. Remember what we said in the second Pasuk. Pasuk Chof Beis. Vayihi Choshech Afela Bechol Eretz Mitzrayim. It was a thick darkness. Meaning, now he adds to something that Rashi said. Rashi said it was a darkness that exceeded the type of darkness we're used to from night, night time. Says the Ramban, actually this was something even more. It was that a very thick mist came down from the sky. And this is why God said to Moshe, stretch forth your hand to the heavens. Moses had to physically bring down the darkness from above. So the idea here is, the Ramban is saying, again, we're still in classic commentary territory. Okay? The idea here is very simple, that there is darkness. And then there's darkness which is compounded by mist and fog. So, you know, I, I never saw this, but apparently in the 1940s, 50s and 60s, there was a type of fog in London which made London very famous for air pollution. It was called London fog. And Londoners used to call it a pea souper because it was like walking through pea soup. And there were, the buses would get lost. So they'd be driving down the high street and they think, OK, I have to turn right here. And they would turn right down the wrong street and they'd get lost. And suddenly they'd find themselves in a completely different neighborhood and there were no bus stops. And the people waiting at the bus stops, the bus would never come. Why? Because the fog was so thick that it would remove the ability of people to actually see what they were doing. You literally would put your arm out in front of you and you couldn't see. Now, in addition to darkness, if you have that kind of fog, it makes it worse than nighttime darkness because your field of vision is so impaired by that kind of darkness that you're unable to operate. So the Ramban uses this as the idea. He, he, he actually takes the words of the Pasuk and he says, he, he translates the word as uh, to mean that he somehow brought down, he, he created the Choshech out of something that he brought from Shemaim. It wasn't just the lack of light, but there was a mist, a fog, that completely impaired people's um, ability to operate through sight and vision. That's what the Ramban says. Sephorno, again, takes this a step further. This is source number four. He says, what does it mean? What does the mean? Remember what we said we translated originally as? It was darkness that could be felt. This plague of Choshech would remove the ordinary darkness called night. And the reason this was necessary was because night darkness consists of air that is ready and capable of absorbing light in the morning. What happens if, we, if it's completely dark and you put a light on, or you light a fire, light a lamp, whatever it is, what happens? So however limited it is, that light will enable you to see at least in the area that that light can penetrate. If you have one of these torches that goes for 100 feet, you can see for 100 feet. If you have something which is much more local, you'll see in a much smaller area, but the light is effective in darkness. Says the Sforno, this Vyomesh Choshech was the type of darkness which didn't actually enable light to perform as we expect it to. Light works, I mean, the way we understand it, we're going to get into science in a minute. The way that light works is that, first of all, what is darkness? It's an interesting question. What is darkness? The absence of light. Okay, so this is a big question when we deal with the creation narrative. What do you mean you separated light from dark? 
I think we've, we've dealt with it in previous years in the Shurim. But here we're talking about darkness as an entity in and of itself. This is not the lack of light. This is actually the type of darkness that in which light would not be able to perform its usual task, which is to create light in the midst of darkness. It's not that kind of darkness. This is darkness that cannot, that, can, that even if you put a light on, it would make no difference. It wouldn't have any effect. Okay, look what this foreigner says. It's a very interesting idea. The darkness that would occur, that occur now was something unable to interact with light at all. The reason for this inability to interact with light was the density of the texture of this darkness. So, I don't want to tell you the Svarna was a scientist. You're going to see later on that we're going to talk about photons, that he, he's onto something here. That there is a darkness which is the lack of light, but there's also a darkness which actually doesn't offer an opportunity for light to have any effect. And that's the dark, he says, but Yomesh Choyshech is there to tell you that without scientific knowledge, the Svarna has, has um, uh, stumbled onto something which makes scientific sense, as we're going to see. And light would not illuminate, as the atmosphere was not prepared for it. And therefore no one could see anyone else, because even a candle or light could not help in that situation. So the Svarna wants to offer a scientific, as it were, without using science, a scientific explanation for Choyshech. This was a Choyshech that wasn't ordinary Choyshech, lack of light Choyshech that we understand. This was a Vayomesh Choyshech. It was an entity in and of itself, the type of darkness that even if you try and use light to, to, to um, get rid of it, that light wouldn't help. Let's turn the page. We're now on page two of the sources. And we're going to look at Shadal. So you remember that Shadal was this um, incredible 19th century Italian uh, um, biblical commentator, a very from religious man. He ran a, he ran a I, I call it yeshiva, a seminary, a, a rabbinical seminary in Italy. Um, and he was very traditional by Enlightenment standards, but I'm sure that the, some of the Kanoim, the zealots of Eastern Europe, would not have considered him such, particularly because he was clean-shaven. Um, and he was distantly, his last name was Lutzato, he's distantly related to Ramchal. And he says as follows, he says, so inter interesting, he quotes a, um, a Gentile Christian Bible scholar called Johann Gottfried Eichhorn. Who was, uh, who was born in 1752, he died in 1827, he was a German Protestant theologian of the Enlightenment and an early Orientalist. And Shadal quotes his theory about Choyshech, he's going to dismiss it. The Eichhorn Yachas Hamaka Hazois Leruach Chozok Cham Umazik Hanikra Ba'aravi Samum. Anyone know what Samum is? I'll tell you what it is. If you watch Lawrence of Arabia, right? A sandstorm. So he says that there was this, and I guess that Eichhorn is looking for a, an, a kind of natural explanation for the Makkah of, of Choyshech. And he comes up with this idea, it was a sandstorm. Why? Because a stand, sandstorm is the Yomesh Choyshech. You can feel it, it's sand, right? You can actually feel the darkness, but it's not darkness because it's, it's not, the sun isn't shining. The sun could be shining. It's complete darkness because the wind has blown the sand up in such a way that it completely fills up the habitable area of human beings. And they're not able to function because they can't see what's going on around them. In fact, what, what do they do? They stay at home. When you've got a sandstorm, you, you, batten up the hatches, right? What, what's the expression? You close all the windows, you make sure they're tightly closed, you close the doors, and you just sit it out. And you wait until it's over, and then you emerge, the sand is all settled, you sweep it away, and life goes on. Says Eichhorn, this Protestant theologian, that actually the Makkah of Choyshech was a Samum, or Turkey Samiel. In Turkish, it's called Samiel. 
הנוישוב במצרים בפסח עד עצרס באיסום חמישים יום, אני אקרא עם אצלם עדיין חמסין. So we still have this word, we're familiar with our word חמסין, in this very hot period, around פסח time until שבועס, there is this period um, during which winds can blow and there is a sandstorm and you cannot see and it, it total darkness prevails. That was Eichhorn's explanation of, of the Makkah of Choshech. V'oz b'nei odam muchrochim leishev b'veisom v'lo yetzu hachutza. People are compelled as a result of this sandstorm to remain at home, not to leave home. That, that is in the Pasuk, right? People didn't get up from their homes for three days. And they don't go out. V'chol zeh einenu shoveh La'aychon. He says, the truth is, I have a lot of respect for Aichon, but this really is not something which uh, does him due credit. Ki omnam, ein miderech haruach ahu, sheyimshach mimenu choyshech gomur, ad shalayira ishes ochiv besoich beisoi. He says, we have one big problem. The Posuk says very clearly that people sitting at home couldn't see their brother, couldn't see their fellow man, even though they were sitting at home. It's not that kind of darkness, is it? So Eichon is trying to come up with a natural explanation for what Choshech was, which doesn't rely on supernatural, on a nace. The, have, the nace here would be timing. Timing is important, right? And you know, somebody once said to me, of course the Yamsuf split. There was an earthquake. Yeah, yeah. It was very convenient that the earthquake happened just when the Egyptian army was about to kill the entire Jewish nation. Okay, so even if you're going to go that route, it's a miracle. But even so, says Shadal, it doesn't make any sense. Because the Apostolic says very clearly that people couldn't see each other. And in the midst of a sandstorm, it's not that dark that if you're sitting at home, that you wouldn't be able to see the other person sitting in the room. So therefore, while it's a nice and fairly neat explanation, because it explains the Yomush Choshech, and explains the fact why people didn't leave their homes for three days, it does not help us understand how the Posik would tell us that people couldn't see their brother. The Posik is not exaggerating. The Posik doesn't lie. The Posik says very clearly, it's one of the the criteria or the conditions that prevailed during the Makkah of Choshech, that people couldn't see each other. The sandstorm explanation does not help us. Okay. The Torah Tamima, so now we, here we are, the Torah Tamima says, um, that it's darkness caused by blindness. This is source number five on page two. Mavuar b'midrashim. So the Medrash says, it's an interesting idea. What does the Yomesh Choshech mean, says the Medrash? That it had the thickness of a coin. Thickness of a coin? How, how is darkness thick like a coin? It's a, so it's a very, so, okay, so look what he says. He says this is very puzzling, very unusual. How can you ascribe any type of physical um, definition for darkness? It's, how do you say? It's dark and you can't see. How can't you see? Well, how thick is that darkness? It's not the type of it's not the type of definition that you employ when describing darkness that it was as thick as a coin. The Gam Tzorich Iyun, he says, it's, it's puzzling because De Lefi Rashi, Shayakom Meshech Hame'eis Le'eis Kuloi Laila V'lohoyo Yom Kalal. This is another problem. Rashi seems to be saying that the entire period of three days was night time. There was no daytime. How does that work? What are you talking about? That it was it was night time all the time. In Cain, Nishtanu Sidre Bereshis. Why do we have day and why do we have night? Because we know that the world spins on its axis. And there's 12 hours in every day, at least if you're in the equator, where you see the sun. And there's 12 hours of every day where you don't see the sun. Depending on where you are, it could be 10 hours, it could be 14 hours. But essentially, 
summer and winter, there's a period of a 24-hour day when you see the sun and when it's light, and a period of a 24-hour day when you don't see the sun and therefore it's dark. And yet Rashi says that for all three days it was complete darkness, says the Torah to Mima. You know what that means? That the natural order of things was changed to the extent that there was no sun rising or setting for three days because it was complete darkness. He says it doesn't make any sense because we don't have... Uh, to, for, for nature to change is such a great event that you surely sh it should be mentioned. Um, he said, that's extremely difficult. Because we know that God promised Noah and his sons. This is the posuk. It's in Breshis, Perik Ches, Posuk Chof Beis. V'yoyim v'layla lo yishbaisu. There will never be another period in, in history where nature will change that there won't be day or night. There will always be day and there will always be night. That was a, I don't want to say covenant, but it was certainly a commitment that was made by God to Noah and his children. Rashi seems to be saying that this entire concept of a 24-hour day that has both sun and no sun was suspended for three days in order to make way for the Makkah of Choshech. That makes no sense, says the Torah Mima, because of what we read in Parshas Noach. Velula mistafina. So this here we get a, a classic Torah to Mima line. If it wouldn't be for the fact, if I wouldn't somehow be... By the way, you know what this means. If somebody says, you know, um, with the greatest respect, you know that they're about to say something extremely disrespectful, right? When, <laughs> when Torah to Mima says, if it wouldn't be for the fact that I couldn't say this, I wouldn't say it. But then he goes ahead and says it anyway. Velula mistafina lahamti dover chodash. If it wouldn't be for the fact that I don't want to really say something completely new and original, ma'oid ha'yisi oimer de inu nachayshe chaya loy ba'avir rak be'ene ha'anoshim. He says, do you know what chayshech was? It's not something that was out there. This was. I'm going to call it cataracts, okay? This was an eye problem. That the, the um, pupil of the eye was covered in some way with some type of membrane, some type of cover, which prevented people from seeing. That's darkness. So it's blindness. It had the thickness of a coin. There was a membrane that grew over the eye. It was a three-day sickness that everybody in Egypt got. got. And the, the sickness was that they had some type of cataract, which then went away when the Makkah of Choshech was over. And during that period, they literally could not see. It was complete darkness, by the way. Now we understand why you can feel the darkness. You just need to touch your eye and you can feel the darkness. And we understand why somebody couldn't see his brother, his friend, his family member when he was sitting at home. We certainly understand why a person wouldn't want to walk around when they have that kind of illness for three days unexpectedly. They're com taken completely by surprise. They went blind, temporarily blind for three days, says the Torah to Mima. Of course, he says, it's so original that I shouldn't be saying it, but he says it anyway. And in that way, we can understand everything, the whole thing makes sense. Okay, now we're going to look at a Gentile, again, another Christian theologian, but this is a very interesting man, Dr. Edward Mahler, born in 1857, died in Hungary in 1945. Fascinating individual. His specific interest was nothing to do with theology. He was a historian. He was an Orientalist, a and, but he was principally a chronologist. Don't have a lot of chronologists now, but in the 19th and early 20th century, chron chronologists were a very important part of any history department in a university. What were chronologists? They tried to work out the chronology of history. No one had ever done that before. Chronology wasn't a very important thing in history, only locally. You know, who was my grandfather, my great-grandfather, and who were my ancestors two, three hundred years ago? When did the king of um, Denmark live 
We've got no idea. It's not important to us. If it wasn't relevant to me, it wasn't relevant. Chronologists, they were, they were looking at general history. So, for example, if we're looking at Egyptian history, when did each particular pharaoh who's identified in the hieroglyphics live in the context of the year that we're in now? So let's say the year when this chronologist lived was 1900. How many years earlier did this particular pharaoh live and operate? And, you know, the evidence is, is not strong. That means it exists, but it's hard really to fit it in because suddenly you've got to match up different um, archaeological sources and any historical information that you have based on manuscripts. And you're going to try and create a, chronolog a chronological narrative. So we have it in the Torah. We have a, chronolog a chronological narrative in the Torah, but generally histories didn't do that because histories were never concerned about chronology. They were only concerned about the present. Everybody was always busy. They used history only as a tool to promote themselves in the present. Chronology is, is a very modern invention or modern idea to try and create order out of the chaos of historical information. Dr. Edward Mahler, was a chronologist and he tried to work out which pharaoh was the pharaoh of the exodus story and when that and how the exodus story fits in with the chronology of egyptian history that's see i just wanted to give you the the I, the background to what it is that Mahler was trying to do i'm going to read you this is based on a a bit of a, um, I've, I've cobbled this together from various sources and I've created a single narrative. Dr. Edward Mahler was a Hungarian-Austrian astronomer, orientalist, chronologist, and natural scientist. In a book called Handbuch der Jüdischen Chronologie, it was published in 1916, he determines that the period of Hebrew oppression in Egypt began with the expulsion of a group of people called the Hyksos, and he dates this as 1575 BCE. And according to Jewish tradition, we know from our own Medrashim and from the Torah, that the oppression lasted for 240 years. Even though we, we know we were told 400 or 430, we, we know 240 years. This means that 1335 BCE was the date of the Exodus. Mala suggests that the plague of darkness was caused, now here's the, here's the interesting thing, by an eclipse of the sun. That's a new one, right? We've had everything so far, haven't we? We've had fog, we've had sandstorms, we've had blindness, now we've got a new one. Eclipse of the sun. The exodus itself took place in the first month of the year, in spring, during the month of Nisan, as we call it, also known as the month of Aviv. And according to Jewish tradition, it was on a Thursday, which was the 15th of that month. The plague of darkness, according to tradition, occurred 14 days earlier, two weeks before, also on a Thursday, which was the first of the month. The only total eclipse of the sun visible in the Nile Delta from the end of February to the beginning of May during the whole of the 13th and 14th centuries BCE occurred on Thursday the 13th of March, 1335 BCE. It's remarkable, isn't it? Unbelievable. That, so, and, and by the way, this is possible to work out. He's an astronomer. So he can work this out. He can work backwards and tell you exactly when there was an eclipse of the sun. Therefore, the exodus must have taken place on Thursday, the 27th of March, 1335 BCE. According to Mahler, and this is where he, this is his interest. This falls during the reign of Ramesses II. By the way, we're familiar with Ramesses II. What was the name of one of the cities built by the Jews? Are in Ramses, right? So, and he reigned from 1347 to 1280 BCE. The total eclipse of the sun accounts for the complete darkness over Egypt, while in Goshen, there was only a partial eclipse because Goshen wasn't in the main part of Egypt. It was only it was in a in a in a separate area because they didn't want the Jews to live among them. 
So therefore, in Egypt, real, there was a complete eclipse. And if there's a partial eclipse, of course, the Jews can see what's going on because they still have light, which explains why the Israelites had light while the Egyptians did not. And although it says in the narrative that the darkness lasted for three days, this is what Mahler says, which makes no sense as a solar eclipse lasts. If you've seen, if you've ever seen a solar eclipse, you know it lasts just for a few minutes. Mahler explains that they were so frightened they could not move for three days. A fascinating idea. I'm not sure I agree with it, but it's certainly, it's, it's such an alternative idea. And it's, uh, it's quoted here in, in this book, in Hamburg, the Jüdische Chronologie, which has been translated. This was Mahler's idea that it was a solar eclipse, this darkness, which was something which was so unique. They'd never seen the sun. And don't know, what did the Egyptians worship? The sun. Ra is the god of the sun. For them, the sun being obscured, going completely dark, was a devastating moment. It was incredibly devastating. So the fact that it occurred could be considered by them as a plague to the extent that they were completely and utterly frozen into inactivity. Even though it only happened for a few minutes, it affected them for a few days. Okay? And maybe they thought it was going to happen again. They didn't know. That's his explanation. I'm not saying I agree with it. I'm only I'm quoting it because I find it so fascinating. Okay, so that medrash wouldn't work. Yeah. That particular medrash wouldn't work. But you agree it's nice, right? It's neat. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's it gives everybody that well, wants, wants, to, wants, to, wants to make sense of it on a natural basis. Everybody, I mean, yeah. I'm, we're, ha we're happy with Nisim. Yeah. Okay, but we didn't do the shir on Dam yet. We'll have to get to that next year or another year. Yeah, of course, it, it, this would be a proof that Exodus did happen, and it has historic. Okay, so I don't have a name for the next for the next piece. It's anonymous. Why is it anonymous? Because, as you know, I'm subscribed to a lot of online, um, uh, you know, websites which talk about the parsha and talk about all types of Jewish subjects. This is a an online um, an online site called Mioidea. It's like a blog. And people raise questions about any issue that they want. And then other people comment, but not everybody puts their name to a comment. And this particular person hasn't put his name to the comment, uh, but he wants to talk about the scientific aspect. Remember what we said before about the Svarna? So he takes this idea further. He doesn't mention the Svarna, interestingly enough, but I mean, I, I don't even know that he's a Talmud Chochem. I don't know who he is, but he, it, what he says is so interesting, I thought I would, I would include it. Modern science teaches us that light consists of photons. What are photons? Photons are packets of energy that act like particles in many respects, although they have no mass. Why don't they have mass? Okay, so, you, so we have to see if you know physics, because they travel at the speed of light. You can't have mass if you travel at the speed of light. So was Choshech a lack of photons? Okay, an interesting idea. And that seems to be what the Svarna was saying. Slightly different, but what the Svarna said. The problem is this. How can this kind of thark, darkness be considered thick? Remember it says, V'yomesh choshech, choshech afeila. The miraculous darkness God created could have been not due to a lack of photons, but the failure of photons to pass on their energy. Something slightly different. This would have been caused by a very slight slowing down of light from its usual 300,000 kilometers per second. That's the speed of light, right? So if that slows down even slightly, suddenly the, the, it can't, the light cannot pass on its energy because the way that physics is calibrated, it needs to have that in order for it to do what it normally does. When this happens, the photon particles have some of their energy converted to mass. So suddenly the light does have mass. Because we said before that photons don't have mass, but they will have mass if they're traveling slightly less than the speed of light. And that's according to Einstein's famous equation of e equals mc squared. I'll leave you to look at your physics textbooks to work that one out. 
But let's continue. Page three. Scientists have recently proven that photons can be slowed down. At the University of Glasgow in Scotland, an experiment was carried out to prove exactly that. Co-lead author of the study, Jacqueline Romero, said, this finding shows unambiguously that the propagation of light can be slowed below the commonly accepted figure of 299,792, 458 meters per second, even when traveling in air or vacuum. And the other co-lead author, Professor Paget, added, the effect has a solid theoretical foundation and we're confident that our observations are correct. What does it mean? When photons are slowed down sufficiently, they will not emit the right wavelength for our eyes to perceive it. Hence, it would be dark. Even though the photons are there, it would still be dark. Also, their additional mass converted from energy could add more weight to the air that prevents people from moving or being able to stand up. It would have a real effect on the atmosphere, on the local atmosphere, if that's what happened to the photon. So it's a miracle using physics. Do you hear that? This is only a theory, the guy says, but it seems to fit remarkably well with the facts given in Parshish Boy. As Derech Hashem of Ramchal says, whenever Hashem performs a miracle, he does so in accordance with as much of the laws of nature as possible. After all, nature, or as he says, the law of physics, is how the Creator has decided to run the world the majority of the time, according to Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch, a piece we've learned many times before. So here we have another fascinating idea. Not an eclipse of the sun, not fog, not blindness, but photons having reduced energy and therefore creating mass and suddenly all the pieces fit together. One piece doesn't fit together. How did the Jews see? So that piece we haven't yet got. So now I'm going to go, the last three sources go to a very, very alternative and quite radical idea. And interestingly enough, two Hasidic uh, masters of the 19th century, one of them Reb Heinech of Alexander, the other one the Sfas Emes, quoting his grandfather, um, uh, the first Ger Rebbe, uh, as having said the same thing. So it's interesting, they're both Talmudim of the Kotzker. And uh, they both more or less say the same thing. I'm quoting here a Peinach of Alexander, but you can look at the Sfas Emes, he says the same thing. The um, the Alexander Rebbe, yes. So where? From Poland. Yeah. Poland. So before the Second World War, Alexander and Ger were the two biggest Hasidic groups in Poland. Okay. Really? So there you know why. So he must have been called after Reb Chanoich of, uh, uh, Chanoich Heinach of Alexander. That was his name. So, oh, there you go. So this, is, this is real Alexander Torah. And they were both Talmudim of the Kotzka Rebbe. And they both led the biggest... Uh, the Alexander, they say that Alexander Hasidim were somewhere between 150 200,000 Hasidim before the Second World War. They were completely wiped out. He was an anti-Zionist, whereas Ger was somewhat more ambivalent towards Zionism. 150 to 200,000 Hasidim. And Ger established a bridgehead in Eretz Yisrael before the Second World War. So even though many, many Gerach Hasidim were killed in the Holocaust, they'd already established a presence in Eretz Yisrael, and that became the platform from which they grew and thrived after the creation of the State of Israel. The, he says as follows, He focuses on this particular aspect. A person did not see his brother. That is to say, each individual only worried about himself and only looked to save himself and the members of his household, and thus did not rise from under the darkness for three days. Not a single one of them succeeded in rising above the degraded spiritual level that they were caught in. The Egyptians were responsible for their own darkness because of their selfishness and self-centeredness. It was not the symptom of the darkness, it was the cause of the darkness. Their darkness was spiritual. Now it may have begun as a physical darkness, but what 
uh, ultimately happened was that darkness became the way they were. They were dark people. That's a fascinating idea, isn't it? So suddenly, the darkness is only the beginning. It's so dark. What happens? You know that the um, northern countries, if you go to places like we mentioned Finland, Iceland, Greenland, the rate of suicide there is huge. Why? Do you know that they've got fantastic life, these countries? They've got everything they want. It's, you know, they're, they're, their life is totally subsidized, but it's dark. For most of the winter, they barely have daytime. And it's so depressing. They get depressed. And when you're depressed, what is the symptom of depression? The main symptom of depression? Complete self-centeredness. You cannot see anything from anyone else's perspective. You, your problems become the complete focus of who you are. It becomes an obsession. You cannot possibly see something from someone else's perspective. And somebody tells you, it's not as bad as you're saying. And you'll say to them, what do you know? It is as bad as I'm saying. And the person will say, no, no, it's nice. You've got a nice life. People like you. You've got everything you need. No, no, it's terrible. Don't tell me what I know. I know it's terrible. And you're completely blind to anyone else's perspective. Says Reb Chanach of Alexander and the Sfas Emes, do you know what Choshech was? The darkness was only the trigger. Egypt became completely mired in depression. They were unable to see beyond their own little selves to the extent they couldn't see their brothers and they couldn't move for three days. It's the ultimate form of depression. Look what Rabbi Avraham Arya Trogman says. Um, it's in a book, he's a cure of rabbi living in Israel. In psychological terms, darkness represents a sense of depression that is fed by despair and purposelessness. Depression causes people to feel alone, as if no one cares about them, and in turn leads them not to care about others. This phenomenon is quite literally described in the biblical verse in Parshas Boy about the plague of darkness, no one could see their brother. An even more extreme form of depression occurs when people are completely sunk in the abyss and virtually unable to move. They are stuck in a state of physical or emotional paralysis. This phenomenon is also quite literally described in the biblical verse, nor could anyone get up from his place as the Pasuk says, um, the Pasuk says, uh, that this Choshech, it started off maybe as a physical thing, it ended off as a psychological thing. Egypt was mired in depression. They literally could not move. And of course, that doesn't affect the Jewish nation, right? What, what are they anticipating? What are they anticipating? Redemption. So of course they're not depressed. So even though it went dark for a few minutes, maybe there was a solar eclipse. Maybe it's possible. Maybe there was a sandstorm. Maybe it was darkness which was misty. I don't know what there was. It was a terrible London fog that day. But then it was over and they were all happy. Why? Because they're going out of Egypt. For the Egyptians, they knew their life was over. But look as to, now you, Reb Nachman says something so beautiful. Reb Nachman of Breslov, this is our final piece. He says something so beautiful. Because we need to understand why Choshech was the final plague before redemption. Why is it that darkness... Here we go. The evil inclination is more interested in the depression following a sin than in the act of sinning itself. For nothing is as spiritually and even physically debilitating as depression. The exodus from Egypt, nationally and personally, entailed confronting the darkness and returning to the light. They held on to the light and hope of salvation. Just as the plague of darkness immediately preceded the redemption from Egypt, so too the darkest hour always comes right before the dawn. Knowing this secret, 
and deciding never to give up are the greatest antidotes against the evil inclination's ultimate secret weapon of depression. We'll leave it here for today.